Sarah Lamberg, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Joey? I'm doing all right, Sarah. I'm doing all right. I need to ask this question first before we really get into anything too serious. But I'm curious, is there something that you were maybe when you were growing up, even now, is there something that's mostly insignificant in terms of value and, and overall meaning in your life? But if it gets destroyed really in any way, shape or form, even just slightly crinkled or bent, is there something that really freaked you out? Like, man, I cannot let this thing get broken or destroyed or even like ripped a little bit. Um, I, I actually don't have a good answer to that. I'm just been looking around the room here. I would say, I don't have an answer to that. That's what I would say. I would say there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of intangible things. I think because we're in the digital age, a lot of things are stored on my phone now. And so I would just say a lot of my, a lot of my photos, if th those got destroyed, I would just be devastated. Just the media that's, that's consuming my phone. Um, these days, it's just out of control. I think I have like 50,000 pictures on my phone. If any of those got destroyed, uh, quote unquote, digitally bent, <laughs> I would get very, very, uh, be very distraught over that. Well, I think it's maybe a good gauge on your OCD level check as far as it, like nothing little bothers you. For me, I was going to go the route of like a DVD case or a CD case because we used to have those things. And if like the, you know, any, if like the, the, the plastic got ripped or the cover got taken out and like it got messed up, I just, I couldn't handle it and I just didn't like it. And I didn't think it was really possible until I had kids and that happened all the time. So it's one of those things you had to kind of get used to. But I guess, and in, in, in more seriously speaking, one of the things that I kind of wanted to talk about is uh, the world of of media that isn't physical anymore. As you mentioned, photos being digital, um, more and more media is becoming digital and can possibly damage things on a level that we have never maybe been accustomed to in the hands of possibly, we'll say amateurs. What does that landscape look like? How did you even get kind of interested in this? And, and I think there's a lot of agents that have really very little knowledge as to the overall impact that it could have. Yeah, I mean, the, the digital media space it has really grown in the past several years. And I think it's it's grown even in, even faster with, um, you know, the, the COVID environment and everyone being kind of uh, behind their own, their own doors at home and you know, trying to find ways to keep themselves busy. And obviously, a lot of brands are trying to find more creative ways to reach their audiences. There are not, you know, tangible uh, ways of uh, disseminating their, you know, content. So, you know, for me, a little bit of background, um, just to kind of give you some context, I was a media major in college, and I started out in insurance, not thinking I'd be in insurance, and I've been in insurance for about 17, almost 18 years now. So uh, I've always had a passion for media, always had a passion for acting and kind of taken uh, my passion and channel it through insurance. But like you said, the evolution of the digital space, um, everybody's relying on reaching their audiences in, in a more meaningful way. And by doing that, um, they're taking, you know, the, the route via via the web or via a podcast or via social media influencers on Instagram and Facebook and all the other social media outlets. Um, LinkedIn has, has been super popular for uh, professionals to, to disseminate content. So it's definitely been an interesting and unique fast-tracked industry. You know, we're seeing media uh, being disseminated in ways you've, you've really never seen. Technology is, is, is a big driving force behind dissemination of content. And so I think there's, there's a lot of intricacies that are going, going on right now um, as, you know, a lot of brands are starting to build, you know, more brand loyalty, you know, just trying to reach the most, the most population, you know, the, the most bang for your buck. Yeah, you know, and I'm kind of curious where the awareness level is for for this particular set of like risks that I guess you know that that are involved with that because you have one that that you know the the big time influencers probably don't consider this as like a thing that's on the high, you know the first thing they wake up to do on their checklist right they they have other things to do that are much more lavish and 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 more you know we'll say extravagant possibly and then you have companies and brands that don't even you know, really understand how to one, create a YouTube channel in a lot of cases, let alone why they need to protect against like what they might say on there. What are the conversations that go around the people that are looking for this product? How is it even brought to their attention? And, and, and do you think enough of the right people know that they should be having this to kind of protect them? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, that's a good question. I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of the influencers that you're seeing, I mean, there are definitely is a huge element of celebrity social media influencing. Um, and obviously those individuals that have a very deep pocket do probably have a risk management team that kind of can help navigate their exposures around 
around that area of, of influencing on behalf of brands. But when it comes down to an individual um, like myself who might not have as deep a pocket as like the likes of Kim Kardashian and you know other celebrities, um, there is a true exposure here for individuals that are just you know kind of playing around in the social media influencing space. There's definitely some risks involved if you're posting content that you don't have licenses to post. Um, you're saying stuff about a brand that might be you know, defamatory. Um, there's definitely some real exposure to you, you know, individuals that are looking to just kind of fill their time by you know, promoting a, a brand that they might like just on the side. So there's definitely, there's definitely exposure to, to a single individual um, in the way that they post uh, and just you know, the content that they post around you know, various brands that they might you know, really enjoy. As far as it goes with when, like, what kind of conversations, I guess, are you having with agents that are coming to you with risks? Uh, I mean, is it, is it everything from the local mom and pop shop that is starting to branch out and, and, and what are they trying to ensure? Are they having those conversations with, you know, those smaller clients and then obviously working your way all, all the way up the ladder that, that I guess maybe becomes obvious, but I mean, what are the things that you're telling agents in terms of like, Hey, listen, really a lot more people than you maybe realize I'm guessing here might need this coverage if they're communicating, you know, on the internet in some way, shape or form, this is something you at least want to have a conversation about. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the, so I work in the SME space. So this is a really good question. So for us, the SME space is really, um, you know, uh, risks that are under 35 million in, in the client's revenue. So, you know, we see startups every day uh, all the way up and, you know, Beasley obviously writes um, much larger clients, but I tend to focus on the smaller to mid-sized enterprise business. And really the conversation is, is unique because media is not necessarily uh, traditionally been part of the conversation in insurance purchasing. So if by chance they, uh, you know, a small organization is trying to find a unique way to promote their brand, to uh, put content out there in a way that maybe they might be utilizing third-party content in order to develop their, their brand, um, there's unique exposures around that. And so that that's definitely needs to be, it definitely needs to be talked about um, in terms of utilizing third-party content to promote your own brand or using individuals, freelance writers, um, outside contractors to kind of provide the content in order for them to put out a, a holistic uh, strategy around their their their, their brand online or in paper, because um, there obviously is still traditional newspapers out there where, you know, mom and pop shops are still trying to advertise. So, you know, just because uh, a brand, a small, a small shop might be utilizing an independent contractor to provide that content that doesn't necessarily alleviate our insured's liability when they are disseminating the content, um, there has to be kind of agreements in place and making sure that the people who are supplying the content are doing their own due diligence. Because in the end of the day, when you see a small mom and pop shop out there d disseminating content, if they're, in, you know, they're including images and, and logos, et cetera, that they might not have received, you know, licenses for and consent to utilize that that mom and pop shop is going to be the, the for, at the forefront of, you know, the, the litigation. There's a lot of, a lot of, I feel like people... A lot of cooks in the kitchen, if you will, when it comes to putting together uh, a big media campaign, because there are, you know, various, you know, channels in order to get that content, you know, from the from just a, a single individual, um, or you can, you know, get it from a, a source online where it might be uh, just third party content that you can source online. Um, so it's definitely a, a very, a very intricate process when you're looking at the dissemination of media, because it's not just that particular shop creating something they're utilizing various channels in order to bring the whole the whole um uh the, all the content together so you're saying uh, google images is not the right place to go to to save an image and, and then upload it to my website that's probably not a good it's idea definitely, it's definitely a source of uh, of getting your content but definitely not um they're not the most safe way to do it from uh from an insurance perspective from from our end <laughs> well you know you bring up i mean because that's fascinating because you know, even like, you know, I'm sure like your parents, my parents, like, like the idea of them, you know, b people in their running businesses that have been around a while, like the idea of copyright and licensed material is kind of lost on them when it comes to the internet. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, as, as people stream more and more like family events and they realize, oh, I can't play this music in the background. I think that's the similar sort of experience that businesses have of saying like, if this is copyrighted material, you need to have proper licenses for it. How many times have you run into that being 
an issue. I, I guess maybe wh- like what's a common claim that you see that uh, businesses do tend to get tripped up on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, utilizing music in an advertisement that you might not have gotten a license for, that is a huge exposure. Um, obviously, you know, just a just a, a words, uh, words on the internet in uh, an, an, a digital campaign is not always the most engaging. You know, you're going to utilize music, you're going to utilize logos and, and all sorts of images to make the campaign as engaging as possible. Um, you know, music is definitely plays a part in uh, advertising in all, you know, forms and fashions. So, you know, not obtaining licenses to utilize music or images that is that is definitely one of the main areas of exposure that a brand uh faces when they're putting out um, any sort of content on the internet and we do see claims around that improper licensing you got the license to utilize it in this realm but not that realm um and therefore you know we're gonna you know come after you in, in that regard so there's definitely um there's so much content out there and there's so much copyrighted content out there that you businesses do need to make sure that they are adequately protected, not from an insurance perspective, but from a risk management perspective, that you have somebody that's guiding you, perhaps, you know, an, an IP law firm, you know, to really make sure that you are getting the, the appropriate licensing for any type of content, not necessarily just music. I got to ask this question just because, I mean, I'm sure you got to have at least some some interesting story. But on the other side of that, like, what's one of the craziest sort of claims that you've seen, like, where things have gotten, like, you know, again, higher level, like, where you or you wouldn't think it would be an issue, but like, what's what's kind of an extreme example of, of that liability? Um, well, we we just actually launched the product uh, in the SME space in June of last year. Um, so luckily, we haven't seen a ton of activity yet, but we launched this product on the backs of our London media team. So we are really an extension of that, the London uh, media family. So, you know, the the claims really, we do write some really well-known big business. Um, there's definitely been some activity that we've seen. Um, I would say defamation, celebrity defamation. I mean, there's been some activity those are big dollar claims, obviously, like when you defame a celebrity, it can get bad because they have the wherewithal to really go out and litigate that type of claim. Uh, And they're not going to stop until it's it's settled in their favor, because they are in the limelight, and they don't want their reputation to be tarnished. So, you know, while we don't focus on celebrity exposure, in the main, um, here in the US, we do, you know, tend to write that in, in, you know, overseas in London. Um, but that is definitely an exposure that can be pretty severe and, and get pretty crazy. The, the other thing that I've, I've asked this question to a couple of different like insurance executives, just from like, what do they think should be covered like in the future? And I, I got to ask you, this is in terms of like reputation management for, we'll say the average person, is this something that would fit or is there a variation of this down the road? Because people are, it seems are getting in trouble every day for a tweet or for something or other that they've said that you know has lasting ramifications on their professional career. Uh, is that something that would be covered under this or is that something that you think might be an iteration down the road? I think it might be an iteration down the road. Absolutely. I mean, there's definitely an element of reputational management, especially as you grow and as you get more well-known in the industry, in whatever industry you're serving, or, you know, I do think that Part of insurance is managing reputation uh, when it does come to third-party litigation. We do have a lot of products at, here at Beasley that do help manage that reputational damage. You know, it's not necessarily uh, something that is at the forefront of media liability insurance, but it's definitely an element of exposure there because you have a brand that puts out content that defames somebody that's pretty well known that that firm is in the news because they've just defamed, you know, someone that's that's better better known in the industry that can definitely bring down that firm's reputation. And so um, making sure that they're aware of that really it goes hand in hand with getting consent, getting licenses, making sure you have, you know, uh, proper risk management or using the likeness or images of a, a certain individual. So there's definitely, there's definitely exposure to reputation management. I think that that will evolve over time. All right. So if you had to put together like a quick little checklist for agents to sort of run through when they're having this conversation or just kind of give them like a little, like uh, you know, check up with their clients as they're, as they're renewing policies, is there something that you would sort of have them go through just to sort of evaluate their overall need or, or necessity for this? 
Yeah, I definitely think that there's there's some sort of a checklist that you can use. First of all, you have to understand that whatever business that you are, you're going to have a media exposure. Whether or not you're a media company, you have a media exposure. So for example, if tomorrow I create a business to um, sell shoelaces and I, I put a, together this amazing website and I'm using images and content to promote my, you know, to promote my shoelace uh, retail, online retail website, you know, there's absolutely exposure there. Anything, it doesn't matter who you are, if you're putting out content, you have an exposure. So just because your sole focus is not in the media space does not mean that you don't have media exposure. So I would say if you look at a client any content they are disseminating, it could be on paper, it could be online, it could be on a, a social media website. Just because you're posting it on a LinkedIn or a Instagram or a Facebook does not alleviate you of your own liabilities. Um, that's just a source for you to disseminate your, your brand. So really talking about the fact that it's not just a media business that has the exposure. If you are disseminating content, you have an exposure. If you are obtaining content from another source, you need to make sure that you have proper licenses. If you're using images, you need to make sure you have the proper license. If you're using music, you need to make sure you have the proper license. Writing things up, typing things up, just kind of a quick summary of what the what your operation is, you know, in terms of what you're trying to sell, and what 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 the uh, the message you're trying to get across about your product. If you're talking um, negatively about another brand, a competing brand, that's media exposure, um, and you can be brought in against your competition, you know, to you know defaming that um, that that other brand. So I would say if you disseminate, if you are a business and you disseminate content in any way you have an exposure, whether you realize it or not. All right, Sarah, I got three more questions for you. First one, very simply, what's uh, one thing that you hope you never forget? In, in the insurance space or in uh, in in life? <laughs> there, are, there are no rules here, so you can go in any which direction you want. I would say <laughs> one thing I always want to keep in mind is and never forget is to always have fun with, with what I do. I always try and keep it lighthearted because I think that that makes things more enjoyable. Um, and I never try and take myself too seriously. And I always try and keep in mind that I have plenty of room for growth um, and to not, not shy away from other people's uh, constructive criticism. I think that that's one thing that I've really, really realized about myself over the last, especially over the last several months um, as we've kind of been here in this lockdown state never take things too seriously because there's always something bigger and, and worse happening out there than what you're kind of dealing with in the moment. All right, Sarah. Now on the other side of that, what's one thing you still have yet to learn? Oh, I have so much growth. Um, being a better active listener, uh, I think it's something that I really uh, am, am, am definitely working on that. I am a very chatty individual. And so I'm I've taken courses, I'm doing my own personal work and making sure that I'm a, an active listener, I'm a good listener, because um, there's a lot of good ideas and things that I have to say, but I know that other people do as well. And I think that just active listening is something that I'm really, uh, really striving towards. And, I, and I, I feel like I'm making some good, good progress, but I know I have a ways to go. You know, from a management perspective, I am a, a leader here at Beasley, um, really bringing our team, you know, into acceleration mode and really, you know, helping the newer generation of insurance professionals thrive and uh, navigate this industry and, and making sure that they are getting the opportunities that they need because this industry is definitely evolving in a very unique way. And there's a lot of drive that we have here at Beasley with our, more of our young professionals. And so just kind of, you know, taking that and, and moving that forward. All right, Sarah, last question. If I were to hand you a magic wand of sorts to kind of reshape, change, alter insurance in any way that you saw fit, what is that thing? Where is it going and what are you doing? I would say the one thing that I would love to have is better understanding of the value that um, that carriers bring to the table, um, particularly Beasley. Um, we pride ourselves not only on our products and our service, but continued risk management and also, you know, evolving, evolving what we offer and really listening to our clients and being a, a stable carrier. Um, stability in the market is huge. So I think the magic, the thing that I would want you to give me with my magic wand is really 
an eye-opening experience for a lot of our SME insured that, you know, hopping from carrier to carrier might not be the best, the best solution year after year. Staying with a carrier that's really been in this space uh, for quite some time and really kind of understands where it's going. Um, I think that oftentimes businesses lose sight of that um, because they're just not used to this type of insurance. It's definitely a unique type of insurance that we sell here at Beasley. It's not um, your your typical life uh, or property insurance, um, you know, media, cyber, all sorts of things that we offer is definitely a specialist coverage. And so really um, having our our, our insureds understand the value of what we bring. Not only just, we're not just providing a, a promise to pay, um, we're providing many solutions that go uh, all around with that. So I think that's kind of where I would, I would want my magic wand to, what my magic wand to give me. 